Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Antoine Marie. He is a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Political Science at Aarhus University in Denmark. He is an evolutionary political psychologist with a background in philosophy, sociology, political science and social psychology. He conducts cross-cultural psychology experiments and develops evolutionary theory to better understand and, if possible, mitigate the cognitive biases that arise from people having strong moral convictions on controversial topics, typically in contexts of perceived intergroup conflict. And we're going to talk a bit about that today. So, Antoine, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks a lot, Ricardo. Thanks a lot for having me and thanks for that intro. So, uh, let's start perhaps with a sort of by laying some background here. Uh, what is morality from an evolutionary perspective? Morality from an evolutionary perspective is a set of psychological mechanisms uh, that evolve to sort of like facilitate cooperation between people. Mm -hmm. uh, we are organisms that evolve for the most part um, <clears throat> living in groups because you know group life is immensely beneficial if I can count on the protection and on the help of other people I will acquire much more natural resources. I will be in a better capacity to defend myself against enemy groups through the help of others. I will have access to more mates, et cetera, et cetera. So cooperation, uh, being integrated into a group and being able to rely on loyal friends, loyal allies, et cetera, is immensely beneficial. And that's really the ecological niche that we humans have invested since several million years ago. And so morality is the set of like psychological intuitions, motivations, um, all the processes that take place in the mind and that sort of facilitate, that motivate us to be nice to others, to care about how we're being seen by others, uh, that make us want to, um, you know, manage a good reputation, etc., in order to be chosen as partners uh, in the goal, very often unconscious, people don't, don't need to represent consciously that goal of being helped, of benefiting from cooperation. So there's an element of like altruism or prosociality to morality, and there's also another element which is defense against exploitation. You can benefit from the, the help of others only to the extent that, sure, you're nice enough to be liked, but you're also good enough to protect against attempts at de deception, exploitation from others, etc. So you have to sort of like hold that middle ground in between, and that's what we call morality, and it's well represented by the principle of fairness, you know, trying to maintain equality in exchanges and trying to keep a balance between helping others and protecting oneself at the same time a bit. Mm -hmm. Is it essentially a social phenomenon then? Well, yes and no. It's it's um, it's social in the sense that so it's non-social. Let's start maybe with the sort of non-social aspect of the answer. Okay. It's okay. non-social in the sense that um, as an evolutionary psychologist and social scientist, I'm convinced that the mind is populated by uh, innate computational systems that you know are the source, are the regulators of our behaviors. And those systems are parameters, they're influenced, and their very existence um, owes to genes. They're, you know, they're here because it's part of human nature, and we've been naturally selected to have those mechanisms that make us pro-social, that make us issue judgments of approbation, disapprobation, etc. Now, those uh, cognitive systems, they're just little computer programs in the mind that process and treat information. And so they need to receive information in input, and that information has to be coming from either other parts of the mind, you know, uh, perceptual stuff that we're seeing out there, behaviors that we're seeing some people doing to other people, or um, crucially transmitted information, mm -hmm. you know, legends, uh, moral norms, political ideologies, etc. And so to the extent that that information that arrives in, as input to the cognitive systems of morality and post-sociality, etc., varies from context to context, from place to place, to the extent that, inform that information that arrives as input changes, then the behaviors, the responses of the organism can change. So there's a there's a, of course a dimension of like social construction of morality. We may we may be endowed with a universal sense of like being loyal to our group. We may be endowed with a universal moral sense of fairness, trying to you know keep proportions in exchanges with other people, etc. Paying costs and benefits to an equal extent, etc. Those systems are likely universal. They likely evolve by natural selection. But people won't be loyal to the same groups. They won't be uh, loyal to the same ethnicities, to the same political parties, to the same religions, because they live in environments where the perceived obligations and the partners that they have in cooperations are not the same. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, what social functions does morality serve? Well, the, the social functions are, uh, in a way, that, that response is a bit included in what I said earlier. The social function is to motivate um, treating other people well, being pro-social to them in order to get a good reputation in exchange, and as, at the same time trying to protect ourselves against risk of exploitation that are inherent in the fact that most interactions are taking place with people who don't share our genes, and therefore they potentially are in a conflict of interest. People may want to get a bigger cake of um, a bigger, bigger piece of the cake, or they might want to take away with like doing less work and contributing just as much from the work of others, etc. So there's a constant problem of free riding. We are surrounded by people who are potentially loyal partners, but also potential uh, exploiters or cheaters, and we want to protect ourselves against that. One very important specification that I that I should make about that uh, evolved sense of, of morality that I've been talking about is that. For people in the evolutionary sciences like me, there's a growing consensus that on the one hand, the function of morality, the function of like the psychological mechanisms that make us help others is strategic, is Machiavellian at the evolutionary level. It's here because it's good for the replication of your genes. It's here because it's good for your reputation and therefore for your survival and therefore for your reproduction. So the reason why we have morality as a set of adaptations as a species is intrinsically strategic, clearly. However, and that's super important, very, very important, the psychological mechanisms that make us moral at the individual level, the mechanism that make us moral, that make us behave in a prosocial way inside the mind, they don't necessarily need to represent the strategic function of morality. Uh, some systems probably represent that strategic function. We are capable of doing strategies, of strategizing, of being Machiavellian, of, you know, uh, deploying ruses and plans to get away with the most benefits possible. But many other systems in the mind are also genuinely moral, as uh, you know, Nicolas Bomar and Dan Sperber have called them, for instance, in their uh, famous uh, moral reputation paper. We have psychological mechanisms in the mind that motivate us to care intrinsically about helping others, that make us care intrinsically about not feeling guilty, about repairing favors, etc. So there's at least one dimension of the human mind, of the human moral mind, that is like intrinsically moral. We are moral for adaptive reasons, but we are typically not really aware of it. And people often get really shocked when you tell them, you know what, the function of morality is actually to get a good reputation. People, people don't expect that very often. Yeah, right. Uh, getting specific into one of the topics of your research, um, what are strong moral convictions and why do people develop them? Well, strong moral conv convictions are sort of like the name that some people have given in the literature about uh, the situation in which people have, you know, emotionally invested very strongly certain norms or certain militant or activist causes, like, you know, pursuing gender equality, protecting the environment, uh, ensuring uh, racial equality or whatnot. There are you know, an infinite potential uh, number of those uh, moral convictions. And the characteristic of those moral convictions is that they're characterized by um, trade-off in sensitivity. You know, when you don't care too specifically about um, a given course of action or, you know, a given person or a given movie to go to watch at the cinema, you can flexibly convert the benefits that you're going to get from one activity into benefits or costs into uh, another activity. You can flexibly sort of weigh options and decide which one will be conducive to like the, the biggest benefits. And so doing trade-offs, performing trade-offs is something very natural for the human mind. Um, um, at the same time, when people tend to develop strong moral convictions about certain issues, they become, it becomes difficult for them to uh, draw, to, to make those trade-offs. They become obsessed with like, uh, advancing the cause that they care about, and they become potentially blinded to the fact that um, social life is made of multiple goals, multiple ends simultaneously, in between which it's important to draw trade-off. So, for instance, if you're, I don't know, like a hardcore environmentalist, and you're convinced that nuclear power is dangerous, is a sort of contamination that, you know, it's a cause of uh, environmental risk and health risk, etc. You may become trade-off insensitive in the sense that you may stop being able to consider that, yes, nuclear power uh, yields some risks, of course, but it also yields immense benefits in the sense that, for instance, it produces uh, vast amounts of electricity at a pretty low cost, and therefore that it should be considered in the energetic mix of, you know, uh, democratic societies. So people, when they develop strong moral convictions, sort of like are under the impression that a certain goal, a certain threat, a certain desirable end goal that they're pursuing uh, 
they become obsessed by it and they stop remembering that you know there are other values and other goals that we should be able to uh, sort of like uh, trade off between and make conversions um, uh, together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And associated with that, uh, what characterizes the phenomenon of moral rigidity? I mean, perhaps some of what you said is already about that, right? Yeah, moral rigidity is the name that uh, that I've given occasionally, and that you know other people have given to to the to the, to the notion of like having strong moral convictions. Uh, I think it's an expression that I'm borrowing from a, a paper by Philip Tetlock. Uh, probably he's the trends in cognitive science paper of um, about secret values. So moral rigidity is just another way of labeling, you know, the consequence of becoming trade-off insensitive when you have strong moral convictions. Uh, so, so people become tra trade-off insensitive. That's one uh, syndrome of it. Another syndrome is also that people sort of stop seeing that moral goals or moral values are anchored in subjective preference, and people reach a point where they believe that, you know, morality it's it's a question of like fact. You know, you're objectively wrong or you're objectively right on a question. Abortion is not a question of like costs and benefits for the fetus versus, versus versus the mother. It's not anchored in like subjective preferences. It's just objectively right or objectively wrong. It's objectively mandatory or objectively forbidden. That's another symptom of like uh, moral uh, of strong moral convictions. And when I say symptom, I, I use the word you know in quotation marks. I'm not saying that people are pathological because they have strong moral convictions. We we, we right. all we all have them. They're like a normal symptom of of, of human nature, if you will. Uh, but it's important to be a bit reflective about them because. Uh, strong moral convictions uh, bring about dogmaticism fairly often, uh, or at least, yeah, some form of blinding to external, uh, you know, to negative side effects and externalities that those moral convictions can have. Earlier on, you, you asked me about what brings people to develop uh, strong moral convictions. So not just what they are, but also how do people develop them? Yeah. That's a tricky question. Um, very often people will justify their strong moral convictions by saying, Oh, you know, I care about that issue a lot, the environment, abortion, etc., because it, because not advancing it or not, you know, realizing it in society, politically, in policy, etc., would cause a lot of victims. You know, mm -hmm. people uh, you know, justify their more convictions by appeals to principles of justice and to principles of harm. It right. would cause harm. Um, that's obviously true, and that relates to you know the genuine moral sense, uh, the genuine concern for other people's interests that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have that general moral concern, mm -hmm. but I think more often than people like to admit, more convictions are also anchored actually in self-interest. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to be against abortion because you're like a conservative uh, Christian or Muslim, and you have invested early on in reproduction by becoming a parent early, and you have many kids, and you want to reduce chances that the availability of like um, non-dangerous sex may increase chances that your partner cheats on you, for instance. That's a position that's been defended by uh, uh, Robert Kurzman and other people. Uh, you may um, become, I don't know, more gender equalitarian because you happen to be a woman or to be a sexual minority, and therefore you're uh, in the position to suffer the greatest, the greatest cost personally um, from a society that is not necessarily implementing, you know, parity and gender equality, etc. So more often than people like to admit, it seems like little strategic mechanisms are operating in the background, little modules are doing, you know, Machiavellian work, and are pushing individuals to endorse and to emotionally invest the more principles that are actually self-beneficial. Okay. So, so I would say to summarize that there are like two sources of more convictions: mm -hmm. genuine more concerns for others' interests, but also often unconscious calculations about what you would benefit the most from. Okay. And what are controversial topics and why is it that people at least sometimes get polarized around them? Well, polarized topics or polarizing topics are like all those questions around which people, for good or bad reasons, manage to get to a point where they sort of behave tribally, you know? Um, the question of whether, I don't know, vaccines against COVID uh, are work and are safe, the question of whether GMOs are safe to consume, et cetera, the question of whether, you know, nuclear power is safe, et cetera. Those are essentially technical questions. Like to a large extent, they're just engineering, biological, economic, uh, medical questions, right? They're factual questions. But for some reason, um, individuals in society, because we're such a, social species and because we're so group based and so upset with like belonging to groups and because we're so good at like 
gauging the plausibility of what people say as a function of the groups they belong to, etc., people get to a point where those essentially factual questions become politicized or being perceived as being the markers, the brands, the flags of certain social groups that you like or that you want to oppose. And that's what's happening, you know, in the in the U.S. right now, uh, or at least that's what that was extremely clear in the U.S. in the recent years, although it's perhaps a bit declining now. Uh, you know, the question of acknowledging uh, climate change and of wanting to fight it has been politicized. It should be a purely, purely, you know, factual question of like climate engineering, science, uh, physics and chemistry of the atmosphere and of the earth. Well, no, it's been turned into a political battle with Democrats seeing that as a, a really important issue that they have to put forward and Democrats seeing, uh, and, and sorry, Republicans seeing that as a cause that the, that the Democrats are favoring and therefore that they must oppose. So it's as if the mind was really unprepared to relate to factual questions as factual questions, and it was always sort of like begging to see the politics behind the, the, the factual questions. We have a natural tendency to evaluate propositions and claims on the basis of the source that, you know, defends them, etc. And if you don't like the source, or if you like the source, uh, it triggers mechanisms of motivated thinking, uh, you know, like, I want to endorse that claim, or I want to reject it, etc. Uh, give me the argument that will allow me to either accept it because I want to accept it, or to reject it because I want to reject it because I don't like those guys, or I like those guys. So yeah, the tribal, the tribal nature of human, of the human mind is sort of like, you know, um, spilling over um, a capacity, a cognitive capacity for thinking in fact-based terms that we are clearly uh, unprepared for. Mm -hmm. But does morality translate directly into political attitudes? If I know, for example, the moral values of, of someone, can I be sure of the kind of, I don't know, political attitudes that that person supports, political parties, etc.? So you're asking me about like the relationship between morality and politics, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's a pretty big question. I would say that on the whole, uh, politics and morality know are distinct things. There's no deductive relationship between the two. And at the same time, they're like narrowly connected. Mm -hmm. um, there would not be politics if there were no uh, moral disagreements on normative questions uh, or technical questions uh, in society. You know, you need people to be against or to be in favor of abortion, to be skeptical or to be uh, believers of the notion that there is climate change going on, etc., for there to be politics. You need to have people who have moral intuitions that <coughs> um, um, that new policy is good or bad, that that economic policy is going to harm the rich or is going to help them or is going to help the poor or whatnot, etc. So you need to have moral disagreements about um, what people want as normative goals for society, you know, how much, I don't know, poverty we want, how much inequality we want, we can tolerate, how much equality we want between the sexes, between the races, etc., etc. So you need to have people who have more convictions and who have like normative intuitions. But on top of that, because people want to realize, want to fulfill their moral preferences, they're going to tend to organize, they're going to tend to sort of like put the activist hat and to organizing groups to seek to mobilize allies to advance those interests, to advance those moral convictions and to turn them into policy, for instance. So there's always a sort of like a collective strategizing layer that comes added to the moral intuitions at the, at the beginning and the compound of the two uh, we call politics. Politics is like people organizing either in political parties or, you know, associations or demonstrations to voice their concern, to voice their disapproval, etc. Collectively using their social intelligence to form groups to put forward um, those interests that they want to defend or, the, or, or their normative or those normative convictions that they have. So this it's a mix of the two. It's always at the bottom uh, beliefs that people have, moral intuitions that they have, and also a layer of like strategic cooperation, uh, group versus group confrontation, intergroup conflicts, uh, trying to vanquish the other group, trying to outvote them, trying to ridicule them, etc. And uh, you know, galvanizing your opponents and making your coalition well. Your coalition, win, sorry. So, yeah. so it's really, uh, it's really a sort of like hybrid hybrid mix, and people often tend to become very cynical and very strategic when they uh, get on the uh, political uh, cloth, if you will. Mm -hmm. It triggers specific mechanisms in the mind. Okay, but I I mean, is there, for example, a set of moral convictions or moral values that is always associated with a particular 
political pole or party or ideology. I mean, if I'm part of a particular moral tribe, uh, does that necessarily translate or have a correspondence with a particular political pole or party or something like that? Um, so, so you mean, are you asking me if like political parties tend to always um, take a stand on controversial issues and to take a position? Uh, yes, something like that. But also if, I mean, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, certain political polls and a set of moral convictions, for example. Mm. Well, so that's a complex question. So there's a work of like Jonathan Haidt and colleagues, you know, that suggests that uh, liberals and conservatives don't have the... I mean, they have the same universal mechanisms for judging good and bad. They have the same moral foundations, but those moral foundations don't have the same sensitivity in their minds. Uh, you know, allegedly the left uh, should be more concerned with like issues of you know preventing harm and fairness, and the right should value that to some extent, but also value uh, group-based loyalty, issues of sanctity and sacredness in relationship to religion, to you know the body, sexuality, etc., and also value a bit more you know hierarchy and order and everything. So there, there seems to be, I don't know to what extent that description generalizes across cultures. I'm not especially okay. how the moral foundation theory generalizes into you know, so-called non-weird, non-Western societies, etc. I know that there's an ongoing debate about this, but mm -hmm. I'm not a specialist. But so clearly you have moral disagreements. Those moral disagreements, they can be anchored in genetic differences. They can be anchored in different uh, socialization trajectories. They can be anchored maybe in epigenetics and you know, ecological factors in the biological sense of the word. So that people are completely unaware of etc. Um, and then parties which are working to a large extent on the sort of like supply and demand logic, they're going to try to meet those expectations and those demands and those disagreements that people have in society. And so they're going to propose policies and positions that they think answers uh, the populace's um, positions and preferences and, and demands in terms of uh, in terms of, of, of policies. Uh, so that's that's one element. Um, once that process is sort of uh, in place, you have a tendency for people to then use um, their favorite political party as a heuristic on you know what position to take on complex issues. People may have strong intuition on certain topics, but they don't have strong intuitions on all topics. Very often, people are just lacking you know the factual information to take an informed stance. So what they're going to do is that they're going to turn to their favorite party. Let's say I'm left and slightly left wing, so I'm going to go to uh, you know the Socialist Party or whatnot, or I'm slightly right wing and I'm going to go to the you know the Christian Republican Party or whatnot, and I'm going to ask myself, what is it that those guys are supporting on the question of like fiscal justice, on the question of like the minimum wage, on the question of like GMOs or whatnot, and they're going to ask ask themselves like what is it that they think, and I'm going to think the same because I think that that party that I prefer is more competent, is more trustworthy, etc. So under a veil of ignorance, I don't have all the information. I'm just going to trust them. And so when 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 that happens, um, you have a tendency for like political positions to to simplify and to polarize further because people don't take the time to do their own research, uh, quote unquote, or to look for the information and to develop informed opinions. They just look at what their favorite political side is thinking and they tend to endorse the same the same policy. So you have a tendency in politics to have pretty strong correlations between um, you have a, you, you have a capacity very often as, as a scientist to predict what people will think on an issue if you know what they think on another issue. Now, there's also sort of critique of that of that position. Um, Hugo Mercier, for instance, would say that oh, you know, if you look carefully at people's uh, policy opinions, they don't correlate that strongly. Uh, it's a bit all over the place. There's actually diversity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's true. It depends on the level of granularity that you want to adopt. But there's, there's a tendency, especially in the US nowadays, in North America, with the increasing polarization of political life, uh, there's a tendency towards more um, issue polarization, more opinion polarization. And very often when you know someone's position on uh, trans rights or gay marriage or the environment, etc., you can predict with a reasonable level of accuracy what they're going to think on other questions like gun control or abortion. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that somehow an answer to what you were asking? Uh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was exactly that I was asking about. So, okay. um, and is there a link between things like dogmaticism and ideological orthodoxy and intergroup conflict? 
Sure. So, so yes, there's, um, so with my, uh, my current um, principal investigator uh, and colleague, Michael Ben Pearson, we're trying to um, develop a sort of like evolutionary theory of why people become dogmatic on politics mm -hmm. and why they want to censor or to regulate freedom of expression, for instance, you know, the, the witch hunt in the 50s against communists, uh, the persecution of heretics uh, in, of, uh, you know, in the in Catholic societies in the Middle Ages in France in particular, um, the U.S. cancel culture nowadays that is being practiced both by the left and by the right, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yes, you have a tendency in circumstances of like perceived intergroup conflict, as you know, for instance, uh, political polarization increases, people are more or less, um, sorry, more and more seeing themselves as being part of a tribe, Democrats versus Republicans. They are seeing the other side as being evil as being malevolent they're uh, you know they have they tend to have pretty negative feelings about the rival group etc and so when you have that sense of perceived intergroup conflict in society when you have a sort of factionalization or polarization of society people start developing instincts uh reflexes behaviors that make them behave as like good members of of their tribe right like the more you perceive the society as being divided into groups the more you're motivated very often unconsciously to behave yourself as a good group member, as a loyal group member. So you're gonna start doing signaling. You're gonna start uh, maybe um, radicalizing a little bit your policy positions or making pretty big claims to come off as like the nice guy who you know, embodies the ide ideology of your group uh, to an optimal degree, to a greater degree than the neighbors. That's a way of getting status. People are gonna start to maybe disseminate, you know, um, uh, hostile rumors about the enemy or they're gonna start emphasizing how dangerous the enemy group the enemy group is or like how difficult the problem that they are trying to deal with with their coalition is etc as a way of like motivating their allies to join the group to increase cohesiveness and to sort of gang up and bend together against the enemy so it's interesting because the the context of like mass politics and democratic society for instance us democracy right now seem to be triggering mechanisms that likely have evolved in the past in prehistory for, for making us like good, good group members in a sort of like life of hunter gatherers in which we have to contribute to you know, cohesive coalitions and compete against other tribes to explore the resources of the territory, et cetera, and potentially also engage in warfare every now and then. So yes, there's a relationship between behaving tribally and, and per perceiving your group, uh, sorry, your environment as being conflictual. The more you perceive your environment as being conflictual, the more you behave tribally. In return, the more you behave tribally, the more you become radical uh, in your claims, the more you dehumanize your opponents, etc., the more your opponents are likely to react by rejection in turn, right? What those jerks are insulting us all day, they're caricaturing our policy positions, we can stand them, they're just jerks, etc. And so conflict is escalating and just mutually reinforcing itself. And so in that general context, one of the one of the symptoms that Michael and I are interested to investigate a little bit is that tendency that people have to want to, to regulate or to ref, repress free expression. Uh, very often when, you're, when you think that you're being, that your coalition, your group, uh, the Catholic Church, uh, traditional America in the 50s, uh, anti-racist or anti-sexist activists on US campuses right now, etc. When you see, when you think that your coalition is being assaulted by uh, a cultural enemy or like uh, an oppressor or whatnot, be true or false, it doesn't matter. It may be true, it may be exaggerated, it depends. Uh, it tends to trigger willingnesses, uh, intentions to sort of like repress free speech by letting people who support your own ideology express themselves freely, but motivations to sort of um, censor or avoid the publications or public talks by people whom you think might potentially spread rumors, ideas, um, scientific facts, etc., that may contribute to undermine the mobilization, right? So for instance, um, I don't know if I'm a, if I'm a hardcore environmental activist and I think that global uh, warming is going on and it's very serious, etc. And in this case, I clearly have the sense on my side. I may want to um, censor and repress the freedom of expression of the people who are trying to play down that risk because the strategic thinking that is done by those you know freedom of expression um, censors, which I'm not morally condemning by the way, I'm just describing what's happening. Mm -hmm. The logic is that they're trying to um, turn the tap of, uh, source of sources of information 
negative information that may potentially undermine the mobilization. You know, those people who are trying to, trying to play down the danger of climate change or who are trying to uh, discredit the scientific studies that suggest that climate change is going on. If you can somehow stop that information from circulating in society, then you're reducing the chance that people's beliefs, people's perceptions of the threat um, become shifted towards more nuance, uh, less perceived threat, uh, less concern, etc. And so by stopping that shift of like greater perceived threat towards less perceived threat, what you're doing is you're trying to save the mobilization potential. You're trying to maintain a sort of sense of alert or a sense of urgency in your troops for people to keep motivated and to keep, you know, uh, engaging in the costly sacrifices that are required for us to protect the environment. And I could decline that sort of example of how people try to regulate freedom of expression to preserve the ideological causes that they care about by influencing their followers' beliefs. I could decline that example on many other topics, but it's not necessarily uh, necessary. But you have the same behaviors on the issue of like racial equality or gender equality or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So for this last part of the interview, I would like to ask you changing topics now about misinformation and conspiracy theory. So starting with misinformation, what are basically the aspects of our cognitive psychology that provide the basis to it? Where does misinformation come from, basically? So you're asking me about misinformation in general. Uh, or we can apply it just to the scientific domain. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a huge question. Um, many, many psychological mechanisms contribute to people being prone to misinformation, to believing false stuff, to sharing fake news, to sharing conspiracy theories in real life and, social, and in social media, on social media. Um, I think at the highest level of generality, it's important to remember that, you know, we the mind is shaped by evolution and uh, in ancestral times where we spent 99% of our existence as a species, we had no such thing as um, complex um, market societies, wide scale democratic societies. We had no technological uh, advance uh, whatsoever. We had no theoretical knowledge of how in the natural phenomena work. We didn't know anything about biology, about human behavior, about uh, human biology, about chemistry, about, uh, you know, obviously, space, the sky, how, you know, uh, astronomy, um, you know, basic facts of astronomy, etc. We had no, so, so we didn't evolve, we didn't evolve strong intuitions, reliable intuitions about how most processes of the world work. We have pretty good intuitions of like how other people's minds uh, work in the sense that we have a theory of mind that allows us to read people's minds, to guess a bit what they think and to understand, you know, that they are driven by desires and, and intentions, etc. But all that's very rudimentary and often is very limited to our interaction with other people, with other individuals. We're pretty good intuitive psychologists. We're okay individual uh, intuitive psychologists, but we're terrible intuitive biologists. We're terrible intuitive um, mechanics or physicians or physicists. We don't understand all that. So most facts about science, about policymaking, about economics, about COVID, about uh, even human behavior at an aggregate level, etc., they're doomed to be counterintuitive. They just don't get hooked to um, intuitions that are reliable that we have in the mind. They get hooked to intuitions that we have, but are often inaccurate. For instance, we seem to have evolved a sort of like intuitive sense that species have essences, you know, that the world is divided into sort of like heterogeneous um, little categories, uh, that you know, species, plants, animals, etc., have their own little interesting features that don't change over time and that give them the behaviors and, and the, the properties that they have. And we know that this is false. You know, biology is Darwinian. It's been like this since the 19th century. We know that species have no essences. We know that their features are caused by genes that progressively mutate and get selected, etc. So there's not no such thing as an essence. You can, you know, crisscross genes and generate a new species artificially. It's no problem. But that's something that our evolved minds, um, evolved essentialist minds, seem to find a little counterintuitive, even a bit disgusting, a bit sort of like against nature. And uh, well, that seems to be feeding, at least partly among many other mechanisms, um, a fear that people have towards uh, genetic engineering and, and GMOs. Uh, I could also, I don't know, give the example of, of vaccines. You know, it's, it's not intuitive that you're going to... Um, um, 
that you're going to fight against uh, diseases by injecting a little bit of the disease in people's, in people's blood. Like the notion that you're training your immune system by exposing it to a little bit of danger, that's not intuitive. Um, on the contrary, we seem to have evolved pretty automatic intuitions of contamination. And we seem to infer automatically that contact with the harm um, amounts to just getting the harm inside you, right? And so people just, many people don't like vaccines, it seems at least in part because they don't understand that being contaminated by very small doses can, can actually uh, save your life because we have just completely opposite mental reflexes. Mm -hmm. That was uh, but of course I could give you know, so many more. Economics also is highly uh, counterintuitive. Yeah. People have difficulty seeing that, you know, international commerce, for instance, can be mutually beneficial. They tend to see, you know, capital and workforce as being as flowing from one country to another and uh, countries are necessarily being exploding one another. And the notion that, you know, the international division of labor can be mutually beneficial in economic globalization, that's not very intuitive to the human mind. Um, I can uh, link to uh, the really nice paper by uh, Pascal Boyer and Michael Pine Pearson on folk economic beliefs that explains that in, in great detail. So we have folk, folk beliefs, uh, naive misbeliefs about most domains of society, most domains of human behavior and science. And um, if anything, true beliefs are the exception. Uh, naturally occurring true beliefs, naturally occurring true intuitions are really the exception. So we absolutely need uh, to educate people about science, about the foundations of the scientific expertise, and also about their cognitive biases and their naive intuitions for uh, people to have just more accurate beliefs on average on, on, on issues that are like politically, politically impactful. Mm -hmm. But what really does make people susceptible to misinformation? And of course, people, I've already had Hugo Mercier on the show, for example, and we talked about how and why people are not as gullible as we think. So it's not that people fall for all kinds of misinformation, but when they do, why does it happen? So yeah, Hugo, Hugo has done a fantastic work uh, showing that we're not as gullible as many people think. Uh, and, and he's a very important intellectual influence on my own work. Um, so one element of response is the one that I just, uh, you know, laid out that the mind is evolutionally unprepared to require uh, accurate beliefs on most questions. And that, that's something that uh, Hugo also um, acknowledges uh, fully. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's also a growing sense in the social sciences in general, in particular in the evolutionary social sciences, that very often people are also endorsing claims, beliefs, it's sometimes a bit unclear to what extent they really believe the misinformation or the, the the claims, etc. But people tend to endorse all sorts of cl uh, claims and notions because they can um, reach sort of like political partisan goals or like instrumental goals with them. You know, uh, if you are part of a um, Republican subculture that you know um, hates really hardcore the Democrats and Biden and Obama, uh, endorsing what is claiming to believe um, an anti-democrat conspiracy theory like QAnon, you know that you know Hillary Clinton and her friends are running a satanic uh, child sex trafficking, whatever organization in the basement of a pizzeria or some variant of that narrative, that can be a way of like signaling how dedicated you are to that anti-democrat culture. That's a way of signaling how much you hate your opponents and therefore how lucky you are to actually potentially be a good group member on the Republican side, etc. And so there are multiple like, yeah, signaling and mobilization functions that people can accomplish or at least can hope to accomplish, that their minds seem to be hoping to accomplish by endorsing uh, extreme beliefs that are completely far off and completely disconnected from any sort of empirical reality. Now, that's happening within limits because, of course, the crazier the belief, the more it is that it's going to be accepted by people and therefore the more, the costlier it is to herald it. But within limits of plausibility, you can signal your group allegiance pretty well by holding really radical and really simplistic uh, beliefs, in particular those that express that you hate political opponents, because that allows people, that allows observers and potential recruiters to sort you into you know, the appropriate groups. That's one element of, of response. Uh, another element of response sort of connects a little bit to what I was saying earlier, which is that um, very often, um, Thread-based narratives, you know, or conspiracy theories, um, stories that exaggerate how bad an evil, a social evil is, or how dangerous a social group is, or whatnot, uh, 
those can also be helped to manipulate other people's beliefs and perceptions. If you exaggerate a social threat, people are gonna, um, people's concern for it are gonna increase, and so you might potentially get them to rally behind you, to gang behind you, and to to mobilize behind you uh, in that way. Now, it's not always super clear that people really believe, uh, you know, extreme rumors, uh, threat-based rumors, narratives, etc. So quite often people may disseminate them just because uh, they are trying to do signaling with it. But every now and then it seems that they're also persuading potential followers to take action and potentially to rally you uh, behind you. Yeah. So, yeah. Instrumental partisan goals are, are really crucial in explaining the, the transmission of misinformation and its uh, crucial success. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned conspiracy theories there and you talked a little bit about some of the let's say, psychological aspects that give a basis to them. But uh, are there any other aspects of our psychology that explain why we develop conspiracy theories and disseminate them? Yeah, so, so here I was, like a, like a second ago, I was highlighting a lot the, um, the instrumental political motivations that you may have in disseminate political uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, but one sort of like very general encompassing psychological bias that seems to be facilitating the spread and the endorsement of conspiracy theories above and beyond or instead before any form of instrumental motivation is just the fact that the mind seems to be wired for like exaggerating threat. You know, um, when you're dealing with a threat, uh, there's, a, there's a fitness and a, and a survival risk, of course. You might be killed, you might be uh, deceived, or you might just lose resources to a social threat, for instance, like a, a party of people conspiring against you or your family. And so you're under selection pressures at the everything level, um, under selection pressures to develop cognitive machinery that will tend to overestimate the threat in order to make sure that you react to any form of perceived threat and eliminate as much as possible the risk to not react to a potential threat. So cognitive mechanisms, especially when they deal with potential costs, when they deal with threats, tend to be erring, to be wired by natural selection, to err on the side of excessive caution, to be um, overly sensitive. We have the opposite uh, logic when it comes to, for instance, detecting uh, sexual intent in uh, you know, mating relationships. There's evidence by, I think, David Buss and people like that, that uh, males tend to overdetect the sexual interest of women. And that seems to be an adaptation for like making sure, quote unquote, that ancestrally males would not sort of like let a mating opportunity get away, right? So depending on the metrics of cost and benefits, what detection error is the least costly or the most costly, cognitive design tends to be uh, biased in favor of making the least costly mistake. You prefer to overdetect a threat because doing so and potentially misdetecting an inexistent threat is much less costly than failing to detect a threat that may potentially kill you and your kin and, and your kith. All right. So there's a tendency towards overdetecting threat, and that's observed throughout several domains of behavior. Uh, we tend to um, overestimate the proximity with which approaching sounds uh, are uh, sources of sounds are to us. We tend to overestimate the distance that um, the bottom of a cliff is from us, for instance, when, when you're at the top of a cliff. Uh, we tend to overestimate the frequency of snakes or guns or angry faces in noisy backgrounds, in psychological experiments, etc. And it also seems to be the case that we tend to overdetect a uh, hostile intent. You know, in interactions, especially written communication, we have that sort of natural tendency to infer, to assume the worst of our interlocutors. Mm -hmm. That takes a big place, unfortunately, a big role in political conflict. We have the greatest difficulty seeing that very often People who disagree with us politically, uh, people on the right if you're on the left, for instance, or vice versa, people on the left if you're on the right, are not necessarily trying to uh, you know, pursue self-interest and, uh, and naive views, but they're also trying to do their best to defend ideas that they think are universalizable and, uh, and to defend policies that they think will have uh, positive effects for every, everybody. So yeah, there's a general tendency to over-detect negative intent and to to demonize potential uh, enemies or people with whom you have disagreements. And that tendency towards negative intent description seems to play a crucial role in endorsement of conspiracy theories because there's no benefit, uh, there's no clear benefit in not having that bias. And there are clear adaptive benefits to having it. Mm -hmm. So one last question, because of course, when it comes to issues regarding uh, 
misinformation and conspiracy theories, for example, there are scientists, science communicators and other people like that that try to come up with solutions to fight back against their dissemination on the internet and offline as well. Um, and sometimes, for example, I know that some people talk about uh, moralizing the values associated with a sort of evidence-based approach to knowledge and logical thinking. Yeah. But do we know if that really works? So you're right. There's a lot of interest uh, in the same community, in the scientific community, for like ways of potentially uh, reducing a little bit. Um, the, the frequency of people's misbeliefs and, and their spread online and offline. And one potential sort of idea that you might have to fight that um, frequency of misinformation in society is, uh, could be that, oh, you know, we should maybe consider educating people to, to value, to moralize a bit more, to elevate as a moral virtue, the values of thinking uh, logically and rationally and in evidence-based ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not denying that this idea is always bad. Uh, it might work sometimes. Um, but we've done work with Michael uh, Ben Pearson that found that in a somewhat counterintuitive way, mm -hmm. people who seem to be drawn to moralize rationality, there's a scale that allows us to measure you know, the degree to which people elevate thinking logically and in evidence-based way as a, as a moral virtue. The extent, people who, who are higher in that propensity to moralize rationality, are surprisingly more likely to share um, misinformation in the sense that they're more likely to report wanting to share on social media. Uh, conspiracy theories and fake news are hostile to their political opponents. That's really weird, right? Yeah. And so what seems to be going on is that um, the people who claim to be moralizing rationality, at least some of them, at least those in our sample, um, what's happening is that there are people who are actually strong partisans that are here to, you know, that are out there to potentially, um, you know, assault and, and, and discredit their political opponents. They want to mobilize allies against the other group. They are clearly taking part in the cultural war in the U.S., etc. And they are like strong partisans and everything, and they don't like the opponents. And they're going to claim to moralize rationality. They're going to claim to be having the beliefs that they have and the moral convictions that they have. They're going to claim that those things are like universal and universal uh, universalizable and anchored in just like common sense and you know a clear objective assessment of the facts and of the evidence because that's the way of like advancing those partisan tactics uh more efficiently you know if i can somehow convince uh people around me uh, observers um fellow allies potential uh, opponents as well that you know, the, the moral goals, the moral interests, uh, the, the strategic interests and the partisan interests that I'm pursuing at Sarah, that I'm not doing this out of just uh, selfishness, personal concern in Sarah, but that those values, those beliefs are somehow universalizable, then I'm in a better position to persuade people to support those causes and, and, and to, to help me advance those interests, right? Mm -hmm. So it seems that there's a relationship between having political ambitions, uh, study-seeking ambitions, intentions to do signaling and to mobilize allies uh, for a political cause and tendency to frame your motivations as being moral, right? As being, as being like the true moral path that we have to follow. Because moralization um, seems to be an efficient way of like making a cause, a commitment that you have seem as unobjectionable, as being universal, right? And so in, in our data, what we find is that people who claim to be moralizing rationality they are more likely to share hostile misinformation, misinformation hostile to their political opponents. And we sort of like demonstrate the relationship between moralized rationality by showing that, first of all, moralized rationality is strongly uh, correlated with measurements of steady seeking and dominance that are involved in the psychology of partisanship, that are very central to the psychology of partisanship. And we show that when you statistically control for the relationship between um, moralizing rationality on the one hand and sharing uh, hostile news on the other hand, when you control for that relationship uh, with um, dominance measures, study seeking by dominance measures, the relationship largely disappears. So it really seems to be the case that moralized rationality is, at least in some people, underpinned by study seeking. That is a sort of like strategy to advance dominance oriented uh, partisan, uh, partisan motivations, partisan agendas. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the Internet? 
Sure. So there's, uh, there's my Twitter on which I'm moderately active. Uh, my handle is uh, uh, capital A underscore capital M A R I E uh, A Marie underscore S C I like science. Um, voila. Um, I also have a website which is a Wix site, um, and I don't remember the exact URL, but maybe you can provide that in description under the video later. Sure. But there's also, of course, all my papers in open access, as well as my teaching and a description of my research uh, in sort of like general terms on my website that people are most welcome to uh, go and check out. Mm -hmm. I will be leaving links to that in the description box of this interview. And Antoine, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And I hope to have you back on again somewhere in the future. Okay. Thanks a lot, Ricardo, for the invite, and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, and hit the subscription button. The show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Ricalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Wine, Gardner Becker, Newberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Mark Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Columbus, Jorge Spinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernadini, Alexander Dan Bauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Haslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, and Stanton T. Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dej Araujo, Romain Roach, Dermitri Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gagey, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackleford, Sunny Smith and John Wisman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Caetan, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardus Francis, Thomas Trumbull, and Noon Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Rugieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.